Welcome to another episode of The Swiss Show. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Tuckwood, and today is quite an exciting one as we welcome an absolute Aussie icon, um, someone who simply started a part-time gardening business while earning his PhD in history at La Trobe University. He launched a full-time mowing business in 1982, which was actually the year I was born, with just $24, uh, with just a $24 investment. He now has over 3,800, I believe that might have crept over 4,000 now, uh, franchisees and a turnover of approximately $500 million. Um, he's a published author um, and founder of the Jim's Group. You'll see his face across many, many things uh, with the most well-known probably being Jim's Mowing. Mr. Jim Penman, how are you, sir? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Good to see you, mate. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've already had a bit of a, um, a preview in the in the five or six minutes before we actually launched into this podcast. And um, there's a few things that we're going to die digress into, which I think is going to be really interesting to our audience, which is um, predominantly um, business owners and, and sales professionals. So in case people haven't heard of you, just so we can put everything into perspective, give us your quick 60 to 90 second um, intro into yourself. Who, who are you? What have you done over the years in your words? Well, you, you did most of it. I, I went to university back in 1971, um, intended to be an academic. I, I wanted to understand why civilizations rise and fall and, 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 and came up in my PhD with, a, uh, with an answer which I believe is correct. Um, but to actually prove it, I needed to make a lot, I, need, I needed to run a research project and there was no possibility for a, of a job in academia, because my mind was too wildly radical. So I figured at that stage, um, I had to become rich so I could afford to fund my own research institute, which I'm currently doing now. I'm spending you know, yes. even $2 million a year on, on basic scientific research in the field like epigenetics. Yeah. So that was my aim. And gardening was my part-time business. And, and, and I just realized in 1992, when I was flat broke, deeply in debt, that somehow I needed to become wealthy. So that's what I aim to do. Yeah, well, I'm sure a lot of people can uh, can can relate to that. So you said gardening was your your part time business. Where where did that come from? Was that just a it was just an easy thing to pick up and just start doing and make a little bit of, a little bit of cash? Well, I was I was gardening since I was eight. I knocked on the door of a neighbour, Mr. Tapley, who lived across the back fence, and Bob a job for the for the Cub Scouts. This was pre decimal currency, and uh, he offered me a job. You know, two shillings a week, which was not too bad. You could buy you know a nice block of chocolate for that in those days. <laughs> yeah. Um, to, to rake his driveways and stuff. So that was my first my first ever job. And and I did it for most of my school years too. Um, I just like, I like being outside. I like, I like, I love the outdoors. I love greenery. I love gardens. I still actually work outside on my farm, you know, most days of the week. So I just love that kind of thing. So it was just natural for me. And then when I was doing my, my undergraduate, my PhD, it was kind of something to give me physical exercise, get me outside and it paid pretty well. I could get a lot more money knowing lawns than I could have working, you know, retail or something like that. For sure. And was this, um, cause were you born in the UK? Was it originally? Yeah. Yeah. But don't tell anybody about that. No, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say we were kind of, my, glo- mother, my mother's an Australian staying in the, in, in, um, she went on a trip there after the war and, uh, her family's lived in Australia since the 1830s. So, you know, it's not, we're not, I'm Australian. I'm even my voice, everything. Right, not, yeah, not yeah. A palm. Yeah, not a palm. Um, I'm going through that process now. I've been here 10 years and I consider myself um, a proud Australian these days, um, obviously on the on the Gold Coast. And um, it's always interesting seeing people that have been here for a, a long time and they, they go that this is this is home now. And, um, and and I feel that way. I've got a baby here. I'm going to come into children shortly because you've got a few more kids than I've got. Um, well, actually, I've got... You're not doing too bad. You, you almost got a proper accent now. I've, I've got a friend who's been in America, uh, who's been American, who's been here for 25 years and he still can't speak properly. He's still got this lousy Yankee accent. So <laughs> not doing well, too I... bad. Well, my wife's Kiwi as well, so I'm uh, I'm a little bit messed up. Uh, my my son, God knows what he's going to sound like. Um, but talk to me then. Um, so you, you're in you're in you're doing gardening, right? You're doing your PhD. You um, obviously get into a, a franchising, or you start to build a franchising model. Where was, was there a definitive moment where you're you initially started to employ contractors? I think that's how it was supposed to start. Yeah, um, and then where was the, where was the tipping point? When did you go? Do you know what? I think there's something in this. I think I can make this a lot bigger than this. 
well, it, it was it wasn't so much one point. It was just a gradual realization. See, first of all, when I started mowing lawns full time, I, I just needed to. I didn't think I need you had to do. I had no other skills. You know, I, I certainly couldn't sell. That's for sure. I followed that very badly in the past. So, you know, what else do you do when you your only actual <laughs> occupation that makes money is, is is mowing lawns, gardening. So, and I was just doing that until something better came along. And I tried different things over the years. I tried starting a computer shop, a mower shop. I just looked at different things. I got involved in a hammer at one stage. I mean, all kinds of stuff. I just tried different things. And this little mowing business kept on puddling away in the background. And then I gradually, I gradually that got bigger. And then, and then really what happened was um, in 19, um, like 1980s, um, I had this business that I never, still never thought of something that was going to make come to anything. But then VIP came in from Adelaide, and they had they were a franchise system with 250 franchisees, which was huge, because I had about you know eight or ten subbies, very small business. Mm. And I actually tried to get together with them, and and I rang them up, the state manager, and actually said to him, "Look, I can't compete with you guys because you're obviously far more successful than me. So I'll just you know work to help VIP to grow. I'll, I'll let you have all my customers and." Help to build VIP in the state, and they said, "Well, no, thanks. We don't want that." So, so I just basically had to work out <laughs> what I could do to resist this juggernaut. And I never really thought it'd be that successful. When I, when I actually launched, somebody asked me how many franchisees I might have one day, and I said, "Well, look, if it really goes well, one day I might have a hundred. That's what I told them. One hundred. Wow. Um, as you say, we're just we're just hitting one four thousand, so it's gone a little bit better than I expected." Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So for people that are, well, I guess, a, either looking to franchise their business or buy into a franchise and actually, uh, and actually kind of ride that, ride that train. Um, how do you take, how do you take that, that first step? Cause, it, cause that must've been a, a nerve wracking experience, like from no knowledge whatsoever. Like where, where did you, where did you start? Well, see what actually happened was this. I, 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 I raided their expo at the expo uh, in 1998 which was in the old Melbourne exhibition buildings. And I went in and they used to give you a little badge and I just took it, I put it in my pocket. I didn't want people to know who I was. And I went up to the stand to just ask them. I just said to the guy at the stand, I said, the VIP guy, I said, look, I'm even interested in VIP, tell me about it. Now, the interesting thing about that is I'm absolutely terrible at lying, even worse in those days. So I would have told, if he'd asked me why, I would have told him the truth, but he didn't ask me, fortunately. So. He, he gave me this, just spent 15 minutes telling me how the system worked. He gave me this brochure. And, and um, I went out of it, I was quite excited actually, because I could sort of see there was, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't run a franchise if I didn't believe it was a good deal. Mm. I couldn't do it. And if, I, if you talk more about the sales process, which I will talk about later, how I learned to sell, I'll, I'll show how that works. I couldn't, I had to believe it. So, but, but when I talked to this guy, I said, there are some real benefits to being in a system like VIP. There are, so like, for example, if you're mowing lawns and you break your leg, you can blow your whole client base because six weeks off the ground. Now, mm. six weeks loss of income is one thing, but six weeks without clients being looked after, bang, they're gone. So yeah. there were those kinds of benefits, and I could see that. But when I looked at what they did, I thought, I, can, I reckon I can do a system that will work better for the franchisee, not for me necessarily. In fact, I got this so screwed up i didn't even charge enough fees in the beginning to cover my cost so i a monument made a monumental mistake but the concept was that my franchise was going to be successful so i spent nine months actually with lawyers and i had to get one of the lawyers i couldn't get them to work i actually had a look at the vip contract i got a hold of a copy and i thought this is terrible i wouldn't sign this it's too unfair and i don't want to i don't want to blast vip i have a lot of respect for what what they've done what bill this did but i i thought the contract was was too was too much in favor of the franchisor. So I went to the, like, the lawyers and they said to me, I want a contract that is so good, you have to be mad not to join it. Mm. And uh, first lawyers couldn't help me. They just, they just were hopeless. And the second ones, I spent nine months arguing with them because they kept on saying, you're being too nice, you're being too nice. And I said, no, I want a contract that I would want. And then when I had what I think was the best contract I got, I went to the people I wanted to be my first franchisees, I had some, some good subbies. Most of them weren't that good, but some of them were very good. And there's people who bought lawn mowing rounds off me in the past. And there were some good ones there. So I got them into a room that towards them. I said, here's the contract, have a look at it. 
what do you think as potential franchisees? And they came up with all these, I wouldn't, you know, I don't like this part here and this gives you too much power. I said, okay, we'll change it, we'll change it, change it. So I got a contract that they could all think was a good contract as a franchisee. And then about half a dozen of those signed and that was in mid 1989. And that's how I got started. Yeah, beautiful story, love it. Oh, okay, so in that situation then, you've got all these people in a room and for all intents and purposes, you're now selling them on this 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 idea. Um, and just before um, you did allude to the fact that you were a terrible salesperson, but you managed to convert a, a, a decent chunk of the room. So um, talk to me about how poor a salesperson you believe you were, and then how did that transition to, uh, evolve over the years? Okay. Well, the first thing, I, I have terrible, terrible social skills. My wife says I've got borderline Asperger's. I just blurt things out all the time. I still do it. She still gets annoyed at me. I just don't think twice about how people are going to react to what I say. It's just a peculiarity. So I actually, when I left school, I, I, um, uh, I, took, a, I took a gap year. And one of the things um, I did is I, I got this job in selling encyclopedias. It's not a job, it's commission only. And I was absolutely terrible at it. I spent two weeks knocking on doors and didn't sell anything. And I hated the process, hated it like poison. I tried another job, which is acting as a canvasser for a paint company. I was terrible at that. So I was absolutely awful at selling. I hate the process of selling. I hate the rejection. I hate trying to, I just hate it. I really, really <laughs> didn't like it. That's why I decided, that's it. That's it. I'm going to go mowing lawns gardening. You don't have to sell anything then. Now, I learned to sell in one single day. I actually learned, I can even learn the minute when I learned the secret, which has been the basis of my entire success since then. And it happened like this. I went to see somebody, I was actually running a mowing business, very small mowing business, but with a few subbies and stuff, but, but not really going anywhere. And um, I was doing okay at finding, what I used to do is to build up and sell lawn mowing rounds. That was my method of operation. That's what I was doing because I found out you could make more money doing that than you could actually um, doing the mowing, getting the subcontract income and mm. so forth. So what I would, I'd advertise for, for clients. That wasn't too difficult in those days. Then I would put my subbies to look after them, which was a problem because I didn't give very good service, but at least most of the clients could keep going for a while. And then I would sell the existing run. Now, the first two parts went pretty well, but the problem came when I was selling and I was really, really bad at selling and I hated the selling process so much. It just was, and I actually asked everybody I knew, how do you sell? How, what's the secret of selling? You know, and they said, well, you've got to learn to do it yourself. And I said, but I'm a dreadful salesperson. I've got no people skills. I'm awful at it. And they said, you just got to learn. Now, just to give you an idea how bad I was, I had a little shed in my backyard, a little, little bungalow, which is my backyard office. And I used to be in the office, pretend to work on the computer, but I had a professional salesperson selling my own businesses for me. That's how terrible I was at it. And it all changed in a single day. And I went to see somebody in my church who was a very successful advertising agent, owned a business, partner in this business. And I went into the, and, and I was, you know, this down the hill mowing contractor and stuff and dressed in very shabby clothes and all the rest of it. And this guy had this very impressive office and he was really successful. Certainly a millionaire, he was very, very successful. And after a short wait, he invited me to my office, sat down for half an hour and talk to me about advertising because I wanted to know about, you know, whether I need an advertising agent to help you find more work more efficiently. So he talked about advertising, you know, where to advertise, how to advertise, what message, what media would use, everything he knew from all his experience of advertising. For half an hour, he told me. And at the end of the conversation, he said to me, Jim, look, you don't really need an advertising agency at this stage. You need to do a go and do what I've asked you to do. So I walked out of his office. And my car was parked quite a few streets away, so I had to walk back to it. And as I was walking, I was thinking, if I ever need an advertising agency, I would go straight back to this guy. I would, without any hesitation, I know I will. And as I walked back, and, and, and as I walked back to the car, I was thinking, but why is this? What has this guy done to me? Because you see, he hadn't told me anything about his business. He hadn't asked me, hadn't done anything that a proper salesman should do. All he's done is give me advice. And I knew he can, and yet by doing this, he completely sold me on his business. 
and, and in actual fact, years later, when I did need an advertising agency, like to do some TV advertising when I started, I went straight back to him. And I didn't even know what he charged. I didn't know who his clients were. So as I was walking back, I was thinking, what has this guy done? And then it occurred to me that all he'd done in that entire interview is, is all this concern he'd had was my welfare and the welfare of my business. And by doing that, he completely sold me on his own business without even talking about his own business. And I can remember reaching, I got back to my car, which was a really incredibly battered Holden Kingswood in those days. It was filthy, dirty. It was full of dents. I mean, I had somebody back into it in a car park once and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'll pay. I said, look at the car. <laughs> <laughs> it had the back seat ripped out and put more rubbish in. That's how bad my car was. I never used to lock it. But I remember just reaching out to the door handle of this car and I was thinking, I wonder if this approach could possibly work for selling lawn laying arounds. So I thought, give it a try. Next time somebody rang me, and I used to put ads in the age, in the classified section in those days, and, and, somebody, and, and somebody rang up from the age. Now, instead of talking about my business, I asked him a question. I said, tell me, do you know what the cut of a lawn mowing round means? I remember that first question I asked him. Now, a cut is each job done once. If you've got 60 clients worth $60 each, you've got a $3,600 cut. And that's how lawn mowing rounds are valued. They still are, of course. And that gives you an idea how much income you can make and stuff based on how often you do it and extras and things. So everybody in the industry knew what the cut meant, but I knew that people who inquired about it usually didn't know. So I started off by explaining this to him. And then I started talking about the business and how to be successful. So I wasn't talking about my own business at all. I just talked about the lawn mowing industry and how to find jobs and how to advertise for them and what to charge for them, what was the secret of success, everything I knew. And I was reasonably okay mowing contractor in those days. I knew what I was doing. And when he came to see me, it was the same thing. I just talked about the business. And at the end of it, I simply said to him, look, I've got some customers in your room. That's the detail. Bang. That's it. That's my entire sales pitch. A little bit later, somebody came to me, actually, who'd been to see me, actually rang me up and said, Jim, I've been offered a business in my area. I'd like your advice as to whether this business is better than yours. And this is quite a question if you think about it, because I'd obviously shown him that I was genuinely interested in his success to the extent he'd actually asked my advice. So I thought, well, you know, it, it's got to be real. So I'll give him the real advice. So I asked him the question. I said, OK, how many customers are there? What's the cut? How far apart are they? How long have you been running it? Has he been running it for? And what's he intending to do? And these are all relevant questions if you to know how to value a business. And then I could work out things like what sort of drop off he was likely to get and those kinds of questions. In the end of it, I just said, that's a better business by that one. So I gave the sale away. And I got asked this, the same question three times in quick succession. Each time I advised them to buy the other business. And the third time I actually said, look, it's a better business, but he's charging this much offering that much that's the market rate so i gave away three sales and something happened which completely floored me they all came back and bought from me every single one and for the minute i started doing that approach suddenly this pathetic socially maladroit awkward lousy salesperson i was able to sell and all i did was make sure that every single person I dealt with was as happy as they could be. I replaced clients without hesitation. I always, even if they dropped out the replacements, I'd replace them. I wouldn't argue about it. I would give them advice. I used to run lunches for them. I used to do all kinds of, I just, if they wanted to get out and I, I advise them how to do it, even buy the business back at a slightly better rate. I do everything I could to make this successful. And what I used to do was whenever I made a sale, I put the name of the, the person and their phone number, which were local in those days, on the black text on a bit of white card, and I put them behind me in the office. And I had eventually about a hundred of those things there. And if anybody wanted to come to deal with me, they come to talk to me. I talk about the business. I used to give them a brochure, how to buy or build a lawn mowing business, how to buy it, build your own if necessary, because if it's in their interest, that's what I'll advise them to do. And then I'd say, look, and if you want to know anything about me, ring some of those guys. They'd, pick, they'd write down a few local phone numbers and they'd ring them up and, 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 the, and the guys would say, Jim's fantastic. He does everything he says he does and more. He's always helpful. He'll always do anything he can for you. He'll just look after you so well. <laughs> and I became incredibly good at selling lawn mowing rounds. And despite the fact that having no social skills, you see, because it didn't require it. The, 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 the yeah. thing about it was that I was genuinely, I genuinely looked after these people. So when it came to the stage of wanting to start 
a franchise, I already had people who believed in me, who knew what I was like, and they knew that I would do what I said it would, and I would do everything possible to make them successful. And that was the credibility. I had, there was no sales pitch involved because it was just me. It was my, it was my, the way I treated them in the past. And when I started franchising, I just had that one idea. I'm going to make my franchisees into raving fans. That was mm. it. And people would see, I would, I had, I started off pretty crude. I started off from a little flat next to my house and I was running it from my basement after a while. And VIP meanwhile had this big fancy office in South Melbourne and so forth. And, uh, you, they would say to people, why would you buy a business from somebody who worked from his basement? You know, look at us, we're so much more successful. But, and they come to me and they say, well, why would I do with you rather than VIP? Because only the two of us in those days. Yeah. And I said, well, look, I tell you what, here's a list of all my current franchises, everyone with their phone number. And this is 20 years before the code of conduct. So nobody, nobody provided this. This is all my franchisees. I want you to go and I want you to ring them, ring any of them, ring all of them. Um, the better the people are, the more they're going to ring. I knew that too. That's a sign of a good operator. And then I, and then I said, now this was the only bit of, bit of deception involved in the world. I said, then I want you to go to VIP and ask them to give you a list. Because I knew they wouldn't give them a list. I knew they wouldn't do it, you see. So that's what did it. Because people would ring up and they'd say, well, what's this Jim about? And he said, and they'd say, he's great. He looks after us. He really cares about us. He does what he can. He just busts a gut to help us to be successful. And that's his whole aim. And, that, and these people sold my business for me. Since at the end of the first year I had, you know, remember I, I told you a hundred yeah. eventually, if I'm really successful, by the end of the year, first year I had 60. And wow. I thought, this is amazing. And people were coming through into state. I had no idea about this. Somebody asked me the contract originally had Jim's my home, Victoria, Jim's my Australia. And I said, what do you need two companies for? And he said, well, in case you want to go into the state, and the words I actually said to him is, don't be ridiculous. This is a lawn mowing business. It just was beyond my imagination. So I just had this, this, this concept. It's, um, when I did my research like that, there was such an overlap in the way that like you referenced it before we went live, selling, buy and not selling your, your book, right? I imagine this is where that old cold premise came from. Um, we, we're big believers here in, in exactly the same. We talk about what we call COVs, C-O-V, so contents of value, um, and just educating your market. So whether people use your services or not, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Be known as the thought leaders, be known as the, the, the ethical organization that genuinely wants people to succeed in something. Mm -hmm. And then a natural byproduct of that will be traffic and raving fans as well. So you, you were doing this I don't, I don't know whether it's fair to say before it's time, but you definitely maybe were a pioneer in this style of, um, in this style of selling. Um, Look, I, I've experienced this real estate agents too. I can tell you a couple of, of, of stories which indicate this is pre-franchise days in, in how this works. I had one case where I was actually trying to get this tourist development going up at Marysville. And um, there was a, a building near the front, a small block of land near the front, which I also own. And I went back to the local agent who's doing these things. And I said to him, I want you to sell this for me because I'm running short of money. I actually went broke, the whole thing didn't work at all. But I, I said to him, he said, Jim, you shouldn't do that. He said, because that will hurt your business. It's not good in your interest to sell this. So here's this guy, me going to an agent with a listing, which as you know, in the business is, is what you're after. You want listings, you get listings to get sales. I go to him with a, with a valuable listing and he says, Jim, don't do it. He tried to persuade me not to do it. Now, needless to say, I use this guy for everything all the time because mm. he really cared. Remember another particular case where I was looking to buy a, a property, a house in Melbourne. And I went to an agent and I said, look, the problem I have is that um, it's got no trees. And I really, really like trees. And this guy said to me, oh, there's companies that can actually do this for you. They can actually put the they can actually transplant the trees. And I said, okay, that's very interesting. Could you give me the details? He said, okay, if you buy the property, I'll give you the details. Yeah, wow. That was it. I would not deal with him ever yeah. again. I, I, he lost any possibility of a sale yeah. from me. And th those are two contrasting. Yeah. Somebody who looks after the client and somebody who's only interested in looking after themselves. Yeah, yeah, Va value first. It's not, it's not a, um, a blackmail sort of scenario. And, um, in that regard, then, um, you've been able to, to scale at such a such a pace, like you said, 60 within the first year, which is is phenomenal. We work with a lot of um, franchise companies, including uh, Jim's Bookkeeping um, themselves. 
Um, how have you been able to kind of harness and capture that culture as it's continued to grow? Is that is that an ongoing battle? Because you're still day to day involved, right? Oh yeah, very much so. Yes. Yeah, so, so how do you do that? How do you constantly stay in touch with everybody and make sure that the the culture and the ethics stay the same as they were right at day one? I'm very intensively involved. Um, one thing I haven't talked about is customer service, which is really relevant. I'd like to talk about that later. Yeah. But but I I um I'm really involved in with my franchisees. Every single one of my franchisees has my direct phone number and direct email address, and they can get on to me anytime, weekends, evenings, whatever. And I'm very, very quick to respond. And I always do whatever I can to help them. I never ever you, you just I just don't do things that are that are not ethical. And I know that sounds self-serving, but um, just for an example, you know, you've got a franchisor who's been terminated, all right? And then he finds a buyer for his business. Now, legally speaking, he's got no rights. But in gyms, we just say, that's okay. We'll reverse the termination. You can sell your business. We, we just do that as a matter of course, as a matter of routine. You know, if people leave the business and they're not, um, and they're not, um, they haven't done very well they've failed and some people do it's a minority but they do i mean yeah. we never chase them for money ever ever chase them for money you know i, I know when when we were sent lockdown in, in in new zealand greenacres actually made their franchisees pay fees while they were in lockdown and couldn't work by law now nobody in gyms would even dream of such a thing everybody yeah. thought it was incredulous like, how could you do such a thing mm. they're not making any money but you know what? My franchisors were actually not only got no income from the franchises, and by the way, we let them go out and do the stuff they could do legally, which is things like the emergency services and stuff, but they couldn't generally work. They still cut them down. Not only did they, did they not, we not charge them any fees, and we obviously didn't charge the franchisors for any fees, but um, I know the franchisors were still ringing the franchises regularly during this whole lockdown period just to keep in touch with them because they cared about them. Mm. And that is so typical. You lead from example, and I talk all the time about service to franchisees. Our first priority is the welfare of our franchisees. You're also passionate about customer service. We we um, take on your franchisees, sign on your franchisees and franchisors, we are convinced we'll succeed. That's on the bottom of every email. It's in the front of my book. I just talk about it all the time. And what you've got in gyms is a culture which is very, very, very pro-franchisees. It's often short with the franchising first. And we had a guy called Brian Duckett came out from the UK to one of our national conferences. I um, mean, he, he'd been involved for 20 years and he, he'd been involved in dozens of different franchise systems. And he said he's, he never saw anything like the gym's culture, which is one that, that been talking to the franchisors which is one we genuinely, genuinely cared about franchisees. And that's that emotional thing. And so when I get up and give a talk, but the first talk of training is my talk. I talk about customer service. This is the franchisees. And then I talk about what franchisors do for you and how you can contact me and all the different things we put into contract, like the franchisees can change to a different franchisor. They can vote out their franchisor. They can veto changes to their manual. There's all kinds of changes unheard of in any franchise system in the world and that's all this this franchise is first you are the client you are the most important people we serve you we are your service providers and we talk about that all the time and when it comes to the franchise or training the first talk again i give is me and talk about selection and i talk about all the different ways why you've got to be selective and then at the end of it i emphasize again and again and the main reason you're selective is because you care about the people that you're dealing with and you will not sign somebody you're not you, you, unless you're convinced they're going to succeed because it's not good for them yeah and that whole thing i talk about it all the time i show by example all the time we do we do annual surveys of our franchisees we ask them anonymously how they're going all of our awards in gyms for franchisors are not based on gross profitability they're based on how their franchisees think about them how often do they ring them now ideally weekly monthly at least how quickly do they get back and how helpful are they? That's that's what we measure them. And if you do well, you get an award, gold, platinum, and diamond. Diamond is a big thing with us. And it's very hard to get, but we get more and more franchises every year get it. If you don't do very well, there's a breach notice coming up. Yeah. But a lot of those, but still some. Okay, can I dissect um, a little bit in there, Jim? You said 
um, you'll only bring franchisees on board if you know they'll succeed, right? So if I'm on the other side of that, I'm contemplating becoming um, a part of Jim's group. Uh, what do you see in me? What do you, or what are, you, what are your green flags or alternatively, what are the red flags that say I will or won't succeed? First of all, if anybody's got a background in sales or management, they're likely to be successful. So if you can begin me with a sales background, I'd say this is a very good indication. We know that people need to be in sales because essentially home service is selling. You're selling yourself to your client. Yeah. People in sales tend to be very good at it, management too. So I look at your job background. Um, I look at the way you present yourself. Obviously, do you impress me? Are you the kind of person that I'd want to do business with? Um, have you got a supportive a spouse or partner? Are you investigating the business properly? You're asking clever questions. Are you researching us? If you come to me and you say, you've actually stopped a couple of guys by the side of the road. Now I might not do it, but I'd say, yes, this guy's really got something. Yeah. If I give you the list and you ring people and you ring person after person after person and ask them what it's like, that's a very good sign. What mm -hmm. I don't want is somebody who comes in and says questions like, well, how much can I make? Yeah. Um, that's a question you can ask, but not as the sole thing. It's not a job for heaven's sake. Mm. You don't want somebody who's listening to a smart sales pitch. And they probably wouldn't buy for us anyway because we don't do smart sales pitches. We actually, we don't sell franchises, we grant franchises. So actually what it comes about, be, uh, it should come about if you're interested in a franchise, it's like it's like a job interview. And people go out in the road, well, I them out in the road trialing and, and they have to pass trialing. I have to get two of my trainers have to approve them before I take them on. And these guys weren't paid anything. It's really not paid to pass them. I just said, I sent them out in the road that had to get two good responses where I wouldn't take them on. Mm -hmm. And and they knew that too. So people were actually got in the road and they'd be very keen to show they were good enough to be in gyms. Even if gyms were smaller than the opposition because that was the attitude we took. And people want to be part of a selective organization. They don't yeah. want to be part of a rubbish organization. Yeah, I really like um, that. Don't, we don't sell franchises. We, uh, we grant them. Yeah, that really hits home. And um, what about the, the systems that you've had to put in place then to, to grow sort of the beast that it is? And um, like say, wanting 100 and, and ticking over to 4,000 is, uh, is, is tremendous. There's no other way to, to explain it. Where does the systematic, systematic brain come from, the, 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 uh, the framework and processes that you have to put in place to building a successful franchise? Is that something that you've consciously made an effort to, to learn? Yeah, yeah, we, we've gradually learned. Look, it, it, there's, there's two principles, service to franchisees, service to customers. Everything, everything else relates to that, everything. So the systems I'm talking about are things like the fact that um, we have IT systems, which actually they log their calls. It's like they talk to somebody, they can log them. We actually, just so now it's automated. You can actually do it all verbally and you can record your notes and stuff like that. that reminds you who you're supposed to speak to and stuff like that. So we're always, we, we spend big, we spend a couple of million dollars a year on IT development. We're huge in that area. So looking after franchisees and then the survey is very, very important. And it's a very, very key thing. You know, somebody who just missed the oven gone by one point, they're just kicking themselves. They go, oh, how do I miss that? It's, it's a very, very, very big thing with us getting these awards and purely based on what we... So franchisees are very, very keen to have franchisees like them and approve of them. Um, now, when it comes to customer service, we have all kinds of things. We do things like we, um, we, we record complaints, obviously. Um, by the way, if a customer rings a second time, if the complaint isn't dealt with the first time, it goes to me and I will sit in it until it's fixed. Um, we also survey customers and about a third of our customers respond to surveys, which is wonderful of them. They're really helpful. And then they come back and then ratings are very, very important to franchisees. They really, really chase good ratings. If they get a bad rating or a complaint out of the rating, then they can actually solve it by going back to the customer and do, doing the job again, offering a freebie, anything, anything at all. Make the customer happy, give me evidence, I'll, re I'll remove it. So there's this intense pressure. And franchisees who get too many complaints, they get warning letters, breach notices, all kinds of things that go through and really puts the pressure on them. And the franchise is always coaching them and working out what to do. And I'm talking with them about these issues and saying, well, why did this happen? What can you do about it next time? Um, just all kinds of things. Like when you contact a client and they, you can't get through, you must send text, you must. If you email the quote, you must text. So we're pushing these things all the time, pushing them. Yeah, the, the overarching umbrella seems to be communication, right? Almost over communicate um, and don't, don't hide, don't dodge anything. We're, 
we're, we're not expected to be perfect, but we are expected to be there if things go wrong, right? That sort of yeah, mentality. Yeah. Well, I, I'd always put it in terms of service. We serve our franchisees and franchisees serve the customers. And that's sometimes seen as a bit of a, a tension because franchisees often get very harassed by these complaints um, and, and poor surveys. They don't like them, obviously. It's a very, very big thing. Um, and they get annoyed at me. And sometimes they actually have a go at me and say, Jim, you're a hypocrite. You, you want to put franchisees, they put franchisees first. And yet, you, you know, this is causing me mental illness, these stressing of these complaints that you're, that you're, you're logging against me. You should have taken them off. And I said, well, the problem with that, if I did that, yes, you'd feel better, but then the service would start to slip mm. and then the less work had come through. And I have a whole lot of franchises struggling for lack of work who are now succeeding. Because one yeah. of the things we do, see, services, services, one thing always telling it to a franchise or service or franchise is what makes you successful. It's, it's worthwhile for its own sake. But it really, really is what's going to make because franchisees who are happy and they're going to stay with you and they're going to tell their friends to join. And if somebody rings up your franchisee that they want to like, they're going to say, come in or don't. And mm. that, so that determines the same thing with franchisees. We know that franchisees who don't rate as well are far more likely to leave. They're also far more likely to report poor income. We did one study. We actually figured out of dividing our franchisees into four groups based on customer service. The, on average, about 10% of our franchisees report poor income. It's about 45% good, 45% fair, about 10% poor, but it's not random. Um, we found that of the franchisees who were in the bottom quarter, 25% reported poor income, in the top quarter, 3%. There's a big difference. So we tell them all the time, this is how you're successful. You know, you didn't mm. follow up with a text. That's why you missed out on the job. Not only you got a complaint for it, and I won't take it off because you should have texted, but you missed out on the job. Now, will you please make yeah. sure you do it again next time? So don't make that mistake. And as time goes by, this constant preaching and talking about why it's important is, is having an impact. And it's been quite remarkable, actually. I have to say, since we've started doing surveys in particular, the um, beyond my wildest expectations, our actual complaint rate has gone down dramatically. But what's really interesting is that our number of leads have gone up until our biggest single problem we have right now is unserviced leads. About 30% of our leads are unserviced. And people say, well, you must do massive advertising. And I say, well, actually, no. What's happened too in the last couple of years, especially if you're starting to have to give back money to the franchises, because we can't spend their advertising anymore. They're too busy. Yeah, you know, right. One division fencing about sixty percent of leads are unserviced. Sixty percent, and and we just we just so we, we actually go back and we give the franchisees these huge bonuses because this is all the unspent advertising. Sorry guys, in fact I'm just giving back a whole big chunk of money to, to, to a couple of my fencing regions because we just can't spend it. Because yeah, customer man. service is what really brings people in. You yeah. need to be there for advertising, but I mean the better your customer service, the less you need to spend to find customers. Yeah, I, lo I love that. Uh, so serve your customers and, and revenue will grow. It's not just so sales is customer service and, and we, we talk about it. it's just communication, right? So um, you touched on um, fencing there a minute a minute ago. Um, you diversified away from mowing, um, antennas, dog bark. There's like, what is there, 50 odds? There's, 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 there's lots. Where, where did, when did that happen? Why did we decide to, to pick this model up and go, okay, well, let's see if it works in another industry. Actually, can I just say something about um, about customer service too, which is a very important issue. Now, we have a lot of customers. We have an overrun of customers. We are overloaded customers. I've never heard of any company like our situation. Yeah. But this is despite the fact that we actually make a big point about being dearer than the opposition. In fact, one of the things we hit our franchises with again and again and again is you've got to put a decent charge. I want to see you making at least 60 bucks an hour to the extent that if we get a franchisee who's not getting enough survey knockbacks, because we, if, if the client rejects the price, that's that's a different, it's a dollar, it's a, it's, a, it's a P, it's a price objection. That's not only a poor survey, but if they don't get enough of those, we tell them off. We tell them you should be getting more knockbacks. You're not charging enough. Put your price up 10%. And we said that again and again. We tell I tell my franchisees, you charge, charge at least 10% more than the opposition. 10 to 20% is the aim to charge more than the opposition. Now, our fees on average are about 8% of turnover. So that alone justifies being us. So it's great service, brilliant service, passionate about service, but charge properly for it. We are not cheap as chips. Now, yeah, nice. 
you asked about you asked about diversifying okay now <laughs> you probably get starting an impression that this guy is some sort of a business genius i just want to tell you i am the i am the worst <laughs> estate maker you could possibly imagine no, don't have, ruin it for me jim yes i'm afraid i'm going to do that i have made <laughs> so many dumb mistakes you would not comprehend it and one of them is is this i i this the version of the different systems had nothing to do with me whatsoever, nothing at all. What actually happened was we were going just in the first few years, it's starting to go great. And, you know, mowing was obviously good. And then I thought, let's try cleaning. Well, cleaning is obviously very different because the first start, you, it, it, Jim's is a, is a, is a, is a, a mowing image. This is a guy with a beard and a hat, which is me, actually. It, it, it's just how I yeah. used to look. I, the whole logo is based on a photograph of me and digitalized and so forth. So it's a mowing image, guy with a beard and a hat. Now, if you're cleaning, you don't want that because obviously half the time it's a woman anyway, and who wants to have a woman with a beard and a hat? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So I thought I'll try it, same system, same franchise contract, but we're gonna call it Sunlight, S-U-N-L-I-T with little sprays and stuff to make it nice and clean and bright. So we tried it, sold a couple of franchises, sent them out, didn't work, couldn't, couldn't find the jobs, just couldn't do it. Eventually I said, look, I'm sorry, Listen, here's your money back. It's not going to work. Cleaning is not going to work for us. And somebody came to me sometime later and said, okay, Jim, we'd like to do Jim's cleaning. And I said, no, you don't, because this is a gardening image. This will not work. And they said, yes, it will. We think the image will stand over. And I said, no, you're wrong. It won't work. And they said, look, we're so convinced we'll give it a try ourselves. And I said, well, <laughs> I don't think it's going to work, but I charged them almost nothing just to give it a go. Okay, just to get in and give it a try. So they go out to an estate agent and they'd say, oh, and Jim's cleaning. We're going to say something. Oh, Jim's cleaning. Oh, yeah, Jim's going to like the, like the mowing car. Yeah, okay, all right, give you a go. Because we had a good name, you see, reputation mm. was good. So it worked. It actually helped us to get cleaning clients, even though these are women most of the time. And even though it's not a, the logo works. Yeah, it is not like Virgin. What does Virgin mean? It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, originally it's a music shop, wasn't it? And then yeah, they, do yeah, yeah. And they do airlines and stuff. What's it got to do with the, the brand is simply the brand. So that's what we discovered. Mm. So we started just, most of the people coming to me, a couple of them I tried starting myself, but most people come to me. One of my first franchisees, guy called Andrew, um, who actually bought a lawn mowing around. He's one of my first trainers. He's a great guy. And um, he actually bought a regional franchise down the track a bit when I started splitting up my area. And uh, he came to me and said, I want to do Jim's fencing. And I said, no, that's not a good idea. And, and you know, fencing is not something we should be doing. There won't be much work in that. And he said, no, give me a try. And I said, well, okay, you can do it. Again, minimal minimal cost up front. And he did it and it worked. So fencing's now got 150 odd franchisees and it should be double the stuff of the work we've got. So a lot of the time it's just people, and most, so most divisions started the same way. We had a guy who um, came from Mr. Antennas, which was then the biggest antennas system in the country they had 50 franchisees which is pretty big and um they were paying something over half their turnover to the um to the franchisor and then one of these guys andrew another andrew um came to me and said i'd like to start up jim's antennas so i said all right well that's fine okay so again minimal amount up front which is typical with us starting a new division in jim's is you know you're talking about 20 25 000, not much at all okay. but similar to a franchise actually so we started this guy up um, and he started building it. And, and what we were doing was, was basically you put people on, you gave them a deal where antennas fees are fairly high because of the advertising component, but all the same, you know, you're charging maybe 12% of turnover and these guys were taking out 50%. So what actually happened? We just basically crushed them in the market. Not, not, the, not the market for, for antennas, but that came, but for franchisees. Why would you go to somebody who's going to charge you 50% when we're charging you my 12%? And where our guys would say, this is fantastic. You should be in it. You'd be crazy to them. And their guys would say, I wish I'd never joined. I mean, that was the comparison. We just killed them in the marketplace. This guy actually became a multi-millionaire and sold out later for just under $3 million. Um, he actually bought the rights to Mr. Antennas, believe it or not, which had failed in the meantime. Is there, are there any... Um, are there any no, no capital, things? nothing, just his ability. Wow. And is there, are there any models that have really flown? Which one's been the best producer for you? Could you quantify it? Well, cleaning is our next biggest division. That's got the clean divisions overall have got um, cleaning carpet, cleaning window, cleaning car cleaning. It's got about 800. 
they're doing really well. Once wow. again, though, with everything else, it, it's it's the um, it's not so much the division; it's the person running it. See, yeah. Clinton was never anything much until this guy Hader Hussein um, got involved, and he was when he came to us, he was actually he was a cleaner. He's a guy pushing a mop around a floor, cleaning. He didn't even employ anybody. He just was cleaning. He came to us, bought a franchise, found it was pretty good, did a lot better, became a franchisor, took over regional franchise rights. Um, and then um, he took over what we call the divisional rights, where he sort of splits the proceeds with us. He runs the division, runs the cleaning side of it. Um, hey, that's just a fantastic guy. He's just a really decent human being. Everybody loves Hayda, including myself. I really think he's a great guy. His franchisors love him. His franchisees love him. He's innovative. He's always looking at Bayes to do. I learned so much from him. We, whenever we talk, we're always sparking ideas back and forth. He's just an incredible guy. But it's it's so much the personality. Like like mm-hmm. he's, um, when, um, when he had a, there was a, there was a stage when the business was growing like that. And then for about two, three years, it flattened off and went absolutely nowhere, the clean division. And then it, what happened? Got divorced, lost the focus, got married again, beautiful wife up again. Oh, wow. It was great in the business. So um, another example is uh, dog wash. Now we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, we started off dog wash quite early. In fact, when I started myself, did okay for a while. We got about 60. And then we put this guy in as a divisional um, Jeff was his name. He was the loveliest guy in the world. He's the nice, nice guy. He you ever seen Priscilla Queen of the Desert? It's a bit yeah, old, yeah. I suppose. But you yeah. know, he used to come to national conferences dressed in this in this gear, like Priscilla. That was what he was to do. Uh-huh. Um, lovely guy. But he was an appalling leader. He was soft as marshmallow. I remember having a discussion with him once about a guy who owed him thirty thousand dollars in fees. Now, if you consider average fees about six, seven hundred dollars a month or something. I said, you've got, to, you've got to let him go. Half the money that you're spending, you, you've got, you're spending, it's advertising and national fees and stuff. You've got to let him go. Yeah. He said, Jim, if I don't, if I let him go, you'll never pay me the money. And I said, you think he's going to pay you $30,000? So he was a lovely guy, but a hopeless leader, had no strength. So it dropped to about 32. I then bought it back off him. Um, and then I'd, I'd Buffy doubled it again. And then there was this lady called Sharon Connell, who was fantastic. She'd actually come from a... Um, she bought a cleaning franchise. She actually almost didn't buy a cleaning franchise because she thought she was like a hospital administrator. And she said, well, I don't want to be a cleaner. That's a bit low grade. And then she got a copy of my book, which is one of the greatest things. If, if my book that I wrote, this selling by not selling version, had only got Sharon, it would have been worthwhile just for that. So anyway, she bought this, she got this book, she read it and she said, I love this philosophy. I love this approach. I love this idea, this ethos. We call it the ethos. So she bought a franchise. A few months later, she bought the regional franchise and then she just proved the best person. She started launching all over the place. She sold a million bucks worth of franchises in a year. And she's just does it because she's a lovely, wonderful, warm human being. Everybody loves Sharon. She's always hugging people and stuff. Well, not me. I'm not okay to that. But all the, the, the dogs <laughs> will get together. They're always hugging each other and mostly women and their stuff. She's just that kind of person. And then got to a certain stage and she was successful. So I said to Sharon, how about I give you the dog wash division? I'm not going to charge you for it, I'll just give it to you. But here's the condition. You've got to achieve this and this and this and this and this. So I, I pinched her off Hayna, who was a bit <laughs> knocked about the whole thing because she was wow. so good. And then she built, and now it's more than doubled. But I reckon by the end of the year, we'll have 200. Not that, within, within the next six months, we'll have 200. She's just incredible. So it's Amazing. the right person. Yes. That, that's the, the, that's the overall people people. really care about those they deal with. They're genuinely yeah. decent. The best franchisors are the best people. Brett Blair in pools is another example. He's a great guy. He looks like a surfing. He's, he's took over division when he had 20. He's now got 130 or something like that. He's just a lovely guy. Um, le- leaders, the right kind of leaders in gyms are somebody who genuinely, genuinely cares about people and knows how to show it. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, last couple of questions, Jim. Before I do let you go, um, uh, the, you're, you said to me before you're you invest a couple of million dollars a year into to funding research into the epigen- epigenetics or genetics um, of social behaviour. Firstly, what the hell does that mean, um, and why is that such a passion for you? If I can ask you that question, where does that come from? When I was researching the decline and fall of civilization, and why it happened, why countries become wealthy. What I came to the conclusion of is that it's it's all about character. There's a change in character 
that causes these things to happen. Um, the book's called Biohistory, by the way. Anybody can look it up. Um, you can you can get it online. I mean, it costs very little for Amazon or nothing from us. Um, and I worked out there was a change in character. And now at the time, this is back in the 70s, early 80s, we, I didn't know what caused it. But as time went by, and I kept on, when I was building this business, like every time stage you have, I just go down to manage my medical library and just do research and stuff. And I was writing and thinking and all the time while this was going on. And I realized after a while that these were epigenetic changes. But what's happened because of environmental influences, because of the economics, because of child rearing, because of religious values and traditions and so forth, particularly religious ones, it changed character in a certain kind of way. And the reason that civilizations collapse is because there's this, this factor I call C, which is also what people in biology call it as a slow life history strategy. Anyway, that's the science for it. Um, civilizations collapse because wealth and, um, in, and urbanization decay this character. But the interesting thing about that is that while you can't do much about it in a behavioral sense because the forces involved in it are too big, it would be, should be relatively simple to do it by chemistry. So one of the things that I got the research people to do, and I've been running this about 10 years now, I said to them, um, you get these kinds of good behaviors, this good, good character, food restriction is a simple way to do it, okay? So if you leave animals short of food, like rats, and I'm talking about not starving, just a bit short, like 25% off they'd like to be, you get a number of different um, changes in character. They become much better mothers, for example, much, much better mothers. They're more exploratory, more hardworking in rat terms. Um, there's, there's a number of changes. They're, they're, they're more, um, a bit less social, which means more like the monogamous. There's a number of changes that take place, which are analogous to what happens when you have civilized society. It's a very similar temperament. So, what we did is we did this and we looked at the genes that were being changed. And what's happening is that certain genes are being switched on or off as a basis of past experience. See, you can get this, even if you leave the father short of food a little bit, and then he, he, he has a son, he has children, the children act as if they're short of food too. They get it, it's carried out through the generations. This is exciting science. It's just something that's fairly recent. So what I'm now wanting to do is how do you change the epigenetics without restricting food and sex and the things that normally do it. And one of the things I said to the, the guy who was professor who was running the, the experiments for me, I said, I want you to take the, the, the bedding from the rats that have been short of food and give them to other rats who are not short of food and see what happens. And what happened is when you gave them the bedding, they, they acted as if they were short of food. So there's something in the urine, the pheromones that are actually causing them to act like that. And so now we're doing that. We're actually doing this. We're trying to identify what's in the urine that's doing this. We're also looking at things called microRNA, cytokines, um, microbiome, proteins, a whole different lot of things to try and change this behavior towards this, what I call high C behavior, which is to do with civilization. Mm. Now, interesting thing about it, even though the whole thing is based on civilization, how to make civilizations work, in actual fact, if you could do this, what you would do is have enormously powerful treatment for things like drug addiction, alcoholism, which are very low C. So you make them high C, you could actually, there should be incredibly powerful ways of dealing with it. Certain forms of mental illness in particular yeah. um, would also be amenable. Um, also things like hard work. If you take this kind of stuff, you should be more hardworking, more industrious. You should be more disciplined. Children, should be, people should be more successful in life, better able to get an education. There's all kinds of implications for what this king could do. So what we're actually doing now is I've written a couple of books about it, which has got some interest, but not enough. But now we're doing the hard research to actually develop these particular systems. It's not designed to make a profit, I might say, but um, if we could make it work, it would be worth billions. There's no doubt yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. F fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, my last question for you um, is probably more of a selfish one. I've got my second baby boy due in two days time. Um, You've had 11 children, I do believe. Um, any tips, any advice for us? How the hell have you balanced that and business life, if you do have a balance? Mm. Let me tell you something. No one's success can compensate for failure in the home. And, and I must say, I haven't done it the right way. I've, had, um, I've been divorced three times. Um, I'm not the easiest person to live with, and I sometimes make some pretty poor choices. So, but my children, on the whole, have turned out remarkably well. Look. Um, I love my kids a lot. 
I'm a really devoted father. I just love my children a great deal, but I'm also reasonably tough in terms of expectations. Um, lots of time with them, lots of talking, lots of examples. One of the things we've been very careful to do is not to let wealth get in the way. Our kids have no sense of how rich we are. I mean, they sort of know in the abstract sense, but they don't see it. Yes. You know? You know, I drive a 10 year old car and, and stuff. And, you know, my clothes are nothing special, as you can see. Um, we don't take overseas holidays. I always fly economy if I need to fly at all. We just live in a very simple life. Um, if, we get, if we go out, we eat pizza or something. We, we do not, we, we live very, very simply, like pretty much like most Australians, I would say. So the yeah. children are not spoiled. They always know they've got to work. They're never going to have life easy. They're never going to. They're never going to be able to not work, no matter how much money I have. I'll never do that to them. Yeah. Just, just constant direction, discipline, expectations. You know, need to try hard. The need to be honest. The need to save. And just example talking. Everything just constant, constant involvement and pressure. It's, it's, it's. You love your kids. But you love them enough to want to actually be very clearly directive about what they do and how they live. And you know. It's, I don't believe in physical punishment, but most of it, I don't, I'm against that. It's not necessary. I just, if one of my children, when they were very young, was very naughty, I would, I would, I would, I would whack them. But if they were really naughty, I'd use two fingers. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was physical punishment. That's about yeah. all we've ever had. And yeah, but, wow. but, but, they're, but they're great kids and you just expect a lot. You know, my 11 year old's a wonderful boy. He's, he's just so, we're very close. He loves science and stuff. We're always talking about science and technology and things. He's, but you know, we do a, a fast thing in our church where you can where you can choose to give up something for a whole month. And this last year, he chose to give up video games, which is an amazing, amazing thing for a kid that age who's so addicted to do. Yeah. And he did it, and he stuck through the whole month, and is so proud of him. He said he'd never do it again. But <laughs> These days, I don't, I don't restrict his video games. I say to him, at his 11th birthday, I said to him, there's no more restrictions. You play whenever you want. There's no, there's no times you can't play. You know what? He plays less and he reads more. It's just expectation and closeness mm. and, and constant, constant pressure. You've got to be involved with your kids. You've got to have time. You know, one person I really admire is Bill Gates. You know, this is a guy who's you know, one of the richest men on the planet. And I really admire him. But he actually drives his kids to school. He's a billionaire and he goes and on, not only on the way, he drives there and he drives back past his home again. They, they wash up together as a family in the evening. Yeah. And he's made it quite clear that they're never, never going to get trust funds they don't have to work on. It's, it's wonderful, actually. In, inside Bill's brain, there's, some, there's a series on Netflix, which is great to read about it. But I would recommend, um, I know you, you're presumably not a Christian, um, but the James Dobson is wonderful that way. He talks about how you, how you bring up children. Yeah. From a Christian perspective, but it's still relevant to anybody. It's all, yeah, it's always rele relevant. And like I see that it's leadership, right, as well. And, and it's that there's a crossover there with the way that you treat your franchisors, your franchisees, the customers, and your children. It's involvement, it's caring, it's nurturing, it's discipline, it's pressure in the, in the right type of way and managing expectations as well. So um, it seems that you, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've got a balance because you just live your life the same way regardless of who you're dealing with. And um, that's just to be a good person that inspires people to become the best mm -hmm. person they can be. Um, right. is, Look, the thing, thing people shouldn't do in business and, and sell or anything is to be too focused on money. That's yeah. one of the biggest mistakes I see. The people who want money first tend to make shortcuts. You've got to believe in what you do. As a franchisor, you've got to believe in your franchisees. You want their success about everything else. Now, if you do that really genuinely, in the yeah. end, you will make more money. But people who put money first, it's wrong. And even when you have money, to me, there's to, to spend money on display, having the latest car and fancy gadgets and brand clothing and stuff. To me, that's immoral. It's wrong. And it doesn't bring you happiness. What actually mm. creates happiness is giving money away, is, is what they've discovered through science. If you give money away to a cause you're involved in, like my research, is the maximum way to achieve happiness. And next to that would be experiences and then buying things would be the lowest and especially buying things for the sake of status because that's a zero sum game. Yeah, amazing. Um, Jim, so much value in that today, mate. And I know it went a little bit longer than we probably anticipated, but thank you so, so much. Um, how can anybody, um, if you would like them to connect with you or find out more about um, getting involved with Jim Group if they would like as well? Jim at jims.net. Straight, straight to you, nice.
Nice to I'm very easy to contact. Not by phone, only my face guys ease, but email jim at jim.net and I'll get back to you quite fast. Yeah, I'll vouch for that. You were pretty quick on the on the trigger to respond to me as well. So um thanks again. Um <laughs>